Hi friends, Paul Ward here and welcome to another edition of Farm Talk. I'm very excited today. We are in Satakoy, California, which is just east of Ventura and west of Santa Paula in the heart of Ventura County. And our special guest is Chris Sayer, a longtime fifth generation farmer here in the valley. Chris, welcome to the show. Thank you, Paul. This is Petty Petty Ranch, correct? Petty Ranch, yeah. And you, you farm about 50, 52, 55 acres here. Yeah, there are about uh, 52 acres that are uh, plantable here and uh, another uh, 20 acres uh, in Santa Paula. Oh, okay. And what, I mean, we're sitting in a beautiful avocado <laughs> grove, so obviously you're farming avocados. Is that your main crop here? Uh, yes, for years, uh, really since the 1930s, lemons were number one for us, but uh, we're nearing the end of a transition. And uh, by the end of this year, the last lemon trees will be out and will be uh, 100% avocados. And why are you switching from one crop to another? Uh, so part of it just rolls down to uh, the opportunity for crop rotation. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, some of this ground has had citrus in it for 80 years, and it'll do the crops good to have, a, you know, a change of change of scenery. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, there have also been some changes in the global lemon market and some pest and disease issues that, uh, you know, help to make the decision a little bit easier mm -hmm. to uh, make that transition. And in terms of avocados, I, I know you've got Haas avocado. Is that your primary variety? Do you have other other varieties as well? Yeah, we uh, we grow both the Haas variety and also the lamb Haas. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got slightly more acreage of the regular Haas, but the lamb produces a little bit more heavily. So, uh, you know, depending on whether you count by trees or acreage or fruit, uh, depends on which one is our, our primary. Mm -hmm. They're they're sort of, uh, you know, 50-50. And what is the difference between a traditional Hass and lamb Hass? So the difference is, uh, for a consumer, is, is fairly subtle. It mostly comes down to size. Mm. Um, lamb Hass just tends to be a much larger fruit. I know uh, in last season's crop, our average Hass avocado was about seven and a half ounces. Our average lamb Hass was about ten and a half ounces. So it's a it's a much larger piece of fruit, but otherwise looks pretty similar. Mm -hmm. um, most of your viewers have probably seen them in the supermarket, uh, but they're rarely labeled as lamb Hass. Usually, it just says extra large or jumbo avocado. Right. Yeah. Uh, that, yeah. They just make sure that there's no blemishes when they. Yeah, pretty much. Off the shelf. Pretty much. Yes. Do you sell your own uh, crops, or are you selling to a to a packing house? Uh, no, all our avocados go through Mission Produce, based in Oxnard, mm -hmm. and uh, you know they're one of the global leaders in the uh, avocado world. So we're really fortunate to have them right here in our backyard. Mm -hmm. And so they're shipped all over the world, I would assume. Uh, you know, actually, most California avocados are uh, are just consumed west of the Rockies. Oh, really? Uh, you know, California avocados are only about 10% of uh, U.S. consumption these days. And uh, and so those of us uh, uh, on this side of the country are, are fortunate, uh, you know, to get, the, uh, to get the best. No knock on the Mexican stuff, but, uh, you know, out here where people know avocados and care, that's where most of the uh, California avocados go. And you're doing um, some, you know, out of the box, forward thinking stuff, right? You're, you've got some pretty healthy soil around us. Yeah, one of the things we started uh, almost 20 years ago was really trying to focus on uh, improving our soil uh, so that we could improve uh, water infiltration and retention. Uh, you know, you only have uh, so much land, and uh, it's it's hard to get a hold of more. So uh, we decided to make the best use of it uh, that we can, and so we've. Uh, had a fairly vigorous program of uh, both mulching, you know, bringing in, you know, wood chips to help build up the soil, mm -hmm. and uh, also cover cropping, which is growing, uh, you know, some of them are edible crops of, of barley or, or types of peas or daikon radish, um, which are edible to people, but we're not growing them for that. We're growing them for the soil mm -hmm. uh, because as those break down, those provide more nutrients uh, to help feed the trees and uh, really improve our soil. Uh, texture and structure. So now, do you the cover crops, the radishes, and the other the others? Do you how do you how do you do that? Do you do that down the center of the row, or or between the trees, or how does that how does that work? Yeah, so those go down uh, the center of the rows, mm -hmm. and uh, and usually we uh, seed them just about this time of year. We've already got our seed in the barn waiting, 
and uh, we'll go ahead and get it out once we're pretty sure we've got uh, an inch or more of rain mm -hmm. uh, coming in the next few days. Um, we don't irrigate the cover crop. It's uh, entirely fed by the winter rainfall. Oh, really? And, uh, you know, the philosophy is that we're going to use the winter rain when we've got, you know, the one time a year you've got extra water in California mm -hmm. uh, to grow something which will improve the soil. So in the summertime, we've got, you know, better soil and better water holding characteristics mm -hmm. uh, so that we get to use a little bit less water uh, summertime when you can... You know, you want to get a hold of every drop you can. Right, and then what? How much? How much water do you feel that you're that you're saving when you do a cover crop? So uh, we started it mostly just focusing on wanting to try and open up the soil more so that we could get, uh, uh, you know, eliminate runoff and uh, and uh, you know help uh, improve drainage mm -hmm. uh, because we had a few spots where you know water would pool. Um, and so we really didn't worry about that initially. But after we'd been doing it a few years uh, and I started doing more homework on the other benefits of it, um, I looked up uh, the, uh, the conversion rate of what, what an improvement in the uh, soil organic matter is, you know, the, the, the biomass that's added to the soil. Mm -hmm. And uh, based, on, uh, based on the numbers that we've had our soil tested here, uh, we've been able to improve our soil's water holding capacity by about two and a half million gallons, uh, you know, a year that when it rains, uh, that soaks in and stays right here instead of running off. That's so, phenomenal. Two and a half million. Yeah. Yeah. It was, um, it's been a big change since I was a kid. You know, we just had a, a great rainfall year this, uh, this past year. It was big. And if that had happened, you know, when I was 12 or 13, uh, the couple drains that we have on the property would have completely backed up. And I would have been out there with a shovel every hour, digging them out to uh, keep the, the flooding from becoming a problem. Right. Uh, but as much water as we got this uh, winter, uh, except for the one day where it was at its heaviest, uh, none of it left. Everything we had this summer soaked in. And uh, so that, uh, that, that just, it was, it was great validation because we did a lot of the cover crop work mm -hmm. uh, right going into that, you know, big drought of the 20 teens. Right. And, uh, and so I knew the theory said we were going to be retaining all of this water and we didn't get enough rainfall to actually test it. Mm -hmm. And then we had a few good rainfall years and sure enough, uh, we, can, we can soak up at least two inches more rainfall uh, before you start seeing any sort of flooding issues here than would have been the case, uh, you know. 30, 40 years ago. Wow. And, and are other farmers following in, in the same practice or are you kind of an outlier? Would you say? Uh, well, I'm, I'm proud to say we were one of the first, mm -hmm. um, but, uh, and, and, you know, when we started it, it, it was still a very unusual practice because mm -hmm. for years, you know, the, uh, the mark of a good farmer uh, was to have not a blade of grass. No weeds. To get no weeds, no weeds at all. Right. Um, and, uh, and so when we, planted that, um, initially I was kind of curious what the reaction was going to be. And, uh, you know, my dad came home and told me one day, he's like, you know, I ran into somebody down at the post office and he says, you know, I was driving by your place the other day and I saw all this greenery, get all this, you know, stuff growing in your roads. And then sort of under his breath, he says, are those cum crops? And it was like, okay. So it was interesting that people got it. So he uh, yeah, I'd say we were, I, I can't know for certain that we were the first, we were certainly one of the first to start doing that in Ventura County. Mm -hmm. I would say, uh, it's probably 15, 20% of citrus acreage now, oh, really? uh, is, is guess. And that's, I, I, I've never been able to find a published number, but just sure. anecdotally for sure. keeping my eyes open as I drive around, I'd say it's somewhere in that range. Interesting. Yeah. And would you say this kind of falls in the regenerative category, like you're making your own soil and and the worms are coming back and the and the good bugs? Yeah, exactly. Um in fact if you if you look at the uh you know, historical soil conservation service uh maps for this area, uh this area should have between two and a half and three percent organic matter in the soil. And usually when people talk about uh regenerative agriculture, they're talking about practices that just restore you back to that level um but because of uh, the practices we've been doing uh we've actually been able to s exceed our natural level uh so we've 
repeatedly had our place measured between five and five and a half percent, wow. almost double, you know, what it would be in its natural state. Right. Um, so it's, uh, it, you know, we're, we're very proud of that. And of course, again, that all uh, goes towards helping to soak up water and, and hold that water, you know, into the, uh, you know, into the late spring and early summer. Yeah. By the time we get to late summer, it's always pretty dry. Right. Um, but we see that as uh, as having an impact on our irrigation schedule. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're able to go a little bit longer between irrigations. We need to irrigate a little bit less than we do. And uh, that means we're able to uh, have our avocados growing here uh, with, uh, with nice results, but using about 25% water uh, or less um, than... Uh, uh, than is the standard, you know, classic rule of thumb right. for avocados and citrus. So that's that's big. I mean, it's big. That's a it's a huge saving, and it's uh you know it's a nice peace of mind because we, uh you know we operate with a cap. We can only get so much water in a year, and right. if it's a really bad year, then our allocation is going to get cut. Um, and so we know that even if things got bad enough that we'd take that first allocation cut, we could still continue with our uh, with our practices. Mm -hmm. You say allocation cut means that you have a private well, but you can't just keep it running twenty four seven. You're you're yeah the restriction. So, yes, we we have our own well, which is great in terms of flexibility. Uh, but uh, we're sitting here as part of what's called the Santa Paula groundwater basin, and uh, and that was um, under court order from the early nineteen nineties to say you can only withdraw a certain amount of water from this basin. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it went to court. It was the subject of a lot of legal wrangling. Uh, but they came up with a settlement that says, okay, every property that has a well has this number. This is what you can draw. And if we need to cut back, there's a series of steps. And that first cut is a 25% reduction. Right. And so as we were planning out our, our changes to our orchard and our irrigation system, we set things up with the design so that we could, in normal years, run 25% below our allocation, so that if ever gets bad enough, we have to take that first cut, then we're, we're good to go. Interesting. And, I, and I, I know that an avocado, and correct me if I'm wrong, but an avocado tree can look really pretty, but if you cut back on water, it's not going to, too, too much, it's not going to produce. Yeah, avocados are are not native to Mediterranean cli climates. They're they're happy here, mm -hmm. uh, but they're native to a semi tropical uh, area, and they're used to uh, regular, uh, relatively shallow rainfall. And so uh, we we're finding our, our best results with the avocados is to give them uh, water. You know, every every five days, maybe seven days at the most, mm -hmm. uh, if if possible, just to keep that uh, ground underneath the trees uh, moist. Mm -hmm. They don't have really deep root systems, so we don't need to irrigate a long time, but we do need to uh, give them some water, you know, fairly frequently. Mm -hmm. And if it's going to be hot, you don't water when it's hot, right? You water before it's hot. If it yeah. I, ideally, uh, you will, if uh, if you know that there's heat coming, you want to irrigate ahead, uh, let the trees get well hydrated and get ready for it. Uh, and then once it once the heat is actually here, uh, then yes, if, uh, if, if we can in, in really hot temperatures, say, you know, a hundred plus, then, uh, you know, then we'll try and irrigate at that time too. Mm -hmm. Uh, because of course, usually here, a uh, hundred degree temperatures are, you know, accompanied by east winds. Right. So it's not just the heat. It's also the, you know, the 10% humidity and, you know, the 40, 50 mile an hour winds, which are sucking moisture out of the trees. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, if it's, if it's really bad, we try to give them a little extra, a little extra boost. And I would imagine the cover crop also keeps some moisture in the soil and prevents a dust bowl and, you know, when that, yeah, that wind comes. Yeah, exactly. It, uh, it, it definitely keeps, you know, the, uh, the physical structure of the roots of the cover crop, even if, you know, by the summer, the cover crop's usually dead because it's mostly, you know, annual grasses and it gets mowed down and then dies off. Um, but those, that root structure is still there, so it's still holding the soil in place and uh, it's still holding some moisture in that soil so that, uh, yes, we don't just get, you know, blowing dust, uh, you know, taking all of the, the topsoil we've worked so hard to build. Right. Uh, you know, it stays here. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we paid for it. We intend to keep it. Yep. And you mentioned, you know, cleaning drains when you were 12. How many how many generations has your family been farming? Uh, we've been farming here for uh, five generations. I'm the fifth. 
And uh, so it's, you know, we've seen a few changes in Ventura County over that time. Oh, absolutely. So your your dad was a full-time farmer and your grandfather as well, or was it kind of a hobby for them? And uh, So so because we're, you know, our operation is, is comparatively small uh, compared to some of the others, uh, usually uh, it's been the tradition, if you will, in my family uh, that we go off you know, try, uh, try something else for a few years and then come back. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, because we've never been quite large enough that we could, uh, support, you know, two generations at once, but a generation and a half, yeah, we can do that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. So my dad, uh, went to, uh, you know, he was, he was, uh, uh, worked in aerospace in the 1960s during, you know, the, the space race and all of that. And, uh, and then came back, you know, in the, in the early seventies when he was in his, mid mid thirties to, uh, you know, pick up the reins and, and start taking charge of the family, uh, operations. And I had a somewhat similar, uh, background, uh, out of college. Uh, I was initially, a, a, a pilot and officer in the Navy oh, wow. and, uh, and then worked in, uh, Silicon Valley for a few years during, you know, the original dot com boom, mm -hmm. uh, before coming back, uh, here because, you know, we hit that scenario where, uh, you know, my wife and I had always talked from, you know, as soon as we were married that, you know, coming back to Ventura and playing a role on the family farm, uh, you know, this would be a great place to raise the kids. We were really excited about doing that. And, uh, you know, that in the spring of 2001, when, uh, you know, when the, the dot-com bubble was starting to deflate, right, and, uh, you know, both of our kids were going to have to change schools the coming year anyway, you know, my dad had turned 65. We were like, you know, this seems like this might be the time to do it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, we made the, we made the move and, uh, we're supposed to, uh, supposed to close escrow on, uh, on our place, uh, in Santa Paula on, uh, September of 11th, 2001. Oh, wow. And, okay. uh, and the, you know, the wire transactions, uh, didn't go through. The escrow didn't close that day because nothing, right. nothing good happened that day. Right. And, uh, you know, so it's it's interesting to me is that that, that date, you know, uh, a lot of people like to say, you know, everything changed on that day. Uh, you know, in our case, it really literally did because, mm -hmm. you know, not just professionally, but everything else. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so it's a, it's a, it's a real watermark in, uh, in our timeline. Mm -hmm. You grew up here on this, on this ranch. Yeah. Yeah. I, my, my childhood bedroom is only about uh, 120 feet from where we're sitting mm -hmm. right now. And mom still lives there. She's still there. Yeah. Um, and now you're going to be farming, or you are farming, more acreage in Santa Paula then. Yes. Yeah. So that's also uh, that's also off got us. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, for the first time in a while, we'll be down. It will be a, a single crop operation. But uh, and you've got student groups that now come to the property and learn, kind of next generation who don't really know where their food comes from other than the grocery store. <laughs> you've you've invited education groups to come out and learn here on the farm. Yeah, we were really fortunate to uh, establish a, a great relationship with Mary Marinville and uh, her nonprofit, um, CIAG, mm -hmm. uh, back when CIAG and Mary Marinville were literally the same thing because she was just starting it. She was the only uh, uh, member of the uh, organization at that point. And uh, yet she had a great vision for helping connect kids to uh, agriculture and also um, using that as a platform to uh, not only introduce them to agriculture and, you know, healthy food and, and uh, those types of things, but also uh, as a connector to, you know, science, technology, engineering, and math. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and build a program uh, around that. Mm -hmm. And a couple of years later, when uh, she was looking for a home to actually put that out on the farm, uh, you know, she approached me and we were we were really happy to be able to, you know, provide a site for them to do that. So you've got a little outdoor classroom here on your farm where the kids come and... Yeah, yeah, the the kids, you know, they could come sit under a little shade structure and, and sit on hay bales. I like to call it the compostable classroom <laughs> uh, because, you know, the, the hay bales last, you know, one season and then they uh, return to the soil one way or the other. So. Right. And I understand that you had, you had Sesame Street actually out here. Yeah, yeah. We, uh, in in a future episode, yet to have a, an announced air date, we were the uh, the site for a, a little segment 
that uh, Sesame Street's doing on uh, on figs, uh, where we have a, a very small planting, only about half an acre. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's also where the uh, school program takes place. Mm-hmm. And um, and they uh, were looking for a place uh, that grew them close to Los Angeles for their for their crew and their film structure. Right. Yeah, we were happy to be able to provide a site for that, and uh, and so they came out and, and did a few days of filming. And uh, so one thing I never thought I'd be able to put on my uh, my resume was uh, an appearance on Sesame Street. But there you it, go. I, my already strange resume gets a little stranger with that. Well, that is that that is fun though. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, it was uh, it was it was really uh, you know remarkable. It was a, a great, really professional crew, and mm-hmm. uh, you know really fascinating to see how that gets. How that gets done. Yeah. Learning about kids, learning about figs. Yeah. Yeah. So where do you think technology is going in terms of agriculture and, and uh, water conservation here in Ventura County in California? So I think there are a lot of uh, new tools that are coming along that are going to be really exciting. Um, you know, for most of the 20th century, uh, you know, we were really starting to experiment with understanding agriculture uh, through chemistry, <laughs> you know, understanding uh, the, the needs uh, for nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus uh, that, you know, that trees and plants would have and how to get those to them in the right amounts. Um, but of course, plant biology and, uh, and agriculture is more complicated than, uh, than just the chemistry. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and now with the uh, computing power that's available, with uh, you know, the information uh, that can be exchanged uh, on, a, on a regular basis, I, I think really in the 21st century, we're going to be learning a lot more about what's going on beneath the soil mm-hmm. and, uh, and learning more about what we, what we can't see and what we can't measure, uh, you know, by older methods. Mm-hmm. So uh, we're sitting very close to a, a soil moisture uh, sensor um, and weather station uh, here that uh, can measure stuff and send it to my phone that, uh, you know, 40 years ago, we would have either been able to not measure at all or you know it would have taken a, a, a lab sent uh, a sample sent to a lab right uh, and you know a couple of weeks to get a response back and now we can watch it in more or less real time it's amazing and uh, and make adjustments you know on the fly mm-hmm. and yeah. I, would, I would imagine that different parts of the the ranch too are stay moist longer than other parts of the ranch yes yes if um you know we only have uh, two of these stations right now which uh, I think do a pretty good job of reflecting our, our you know, two major uh, soil types, uh, you know, within the, in the ranch. It, it sort of transitions a little bit as you go east to west. Um, but as this technology matures, then we'll very likely, uh, you know, tweak it at more stations and be able to fine tune, uh, you know, the ability to deliver not just water, but also nutrition. Mm-hmm. Uh, to the trees, just you know, in in just the right amount, but no more. Yeah, the tree is still a, a living thing. You know. It, yeah, exactly. Every living organism needs to be fed, and pretty much no living organism likes to be overfed. Uh, that you know, if nothing else, ends up you know adding expense or creating waste. Have you heard anything about artificial intelligence coming into play in uh, in agriculture? I, I have. I think we're going to probably see most of that. Uh, get applied in areas that uh, that won't necessarily hit Ventura County first. Mm-hmm. You know, we're one of the great agricultural counties in this nation. Uh, you know, two billion dollars a year of uh, of crops leave Ventura County farms to to go to uh, consumers. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that's that's larger than uh, almost half the states in the country. It's um, yeah, it's it's really a, a remarkable thing. But so many of the crops that we grow here are unique either to Ventura County or or generally coastal California. So we're we're relatively small acreage uh, here. So for instance, there are uh, only 50,000 acres of avocados in the whole state of California. Oh really? Uh, I didn't know that. Yeah. That and 50,000? Yeah. Yeah, it's only about 50,000 and about 18,000 of those are right here in Ventura County. Um, and uh, when you compare th- that to, you know, the millions of acres of wheat or corn or so- soybeans in the Midwest, uh, the people who are going to be developing those kinds of tools are, of course, they're going to go after the large markets first. Right. And uh, and then that technology, as it gets perfected, it'll trickle down uh, to the uh, smaller and, and more niche crops. 
So I, I do think it'll get here, but uh, this is one area where, oddly enough, uh, we'll probably be a little bit behind the curve. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we'll still probably see a lot of the uh, technology, uh, particularly in terms of things like robotic harvesters. Mm. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll be one of the last areas where you see those in large force, at least in, you know, in tree crops. Sure. Well, because, the cost of labor gets so much more expensive and workers comp and yeah, yeah. Oh, it, it, it will, it, it will get here. Um, and, uh, and it'll, it'll change the, the face of the agricultural, uh, workforce. It'll, you know, there'll be fewer jobs, but probably better paid jobs in the most part. But, uh, yeah, it, it will, uh, it'll be a, a very interesting transition. Uh, but like I said, if, if, if you are going to be betting some venture capital, uh, you know, are you, are you going to go after the uh, 20,000 acre market or the million acre market? Right. Obviously, you want to go with the big market first. Makes, makes sense. Yeah. Do you collaborate with other farmers in the area or does everybody kind of, you know, do their own thing? Yeah, Ventura County actually has a really long tradition of uh, collaboration among farmers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of the, uh, uh, of the organizations that support uh, farmers here were uh, founded as uh, cooperatives. Uh, you know, 80, 90, or 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm a, a very proud member of uh, the Ventura County Farm Bureau mm -hmm. that uh, has been around since 1914, and uh, as well as uh, a board member for the Associates and Sectory, mm -hmm. which uh, provides, you know, beneficial insects and, and pest control services to growers, uh, and they've been around since 1928. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, there's been a long, long history of pulling our resources and pulling together. Mm -hmm. And you participate in uh, in Farm Day. Yes, that's uh, that's also put on by CAG. Oh, same okay. folks who uh, who bring you a farm lab mm -hmm. here at our here at our ranch, um, and uh, you know, and that's one day a year where they have uh, about twenty farms, Moss or Manos, uh, on any given year, mm -hmm. uh, agree to open their uh, ranches and, and farms to the general public mm -hmm. uh, to uh, to give guided tours and to talk to our our 800,000 uh, urban and suburban neighbors about what it is we do here and what it is they they uh, see as they as they drive past on you know 126 or 101. We're located in a in a green belt, right? A, a farming green Correct. belt. Correct. And it extends like it's like 30 miles long or or longer. Uh, yes, basically from uh, you know the eastern side of Ventura. Uh, you know, you've got the little pockets of the city of Santa Paula and Fillmore, mm -hmm. uh, but otherwise it's uh, pretty much an unbroken agricultural belt all the way till you get to uh, I-5 and Magic Mountain. Mm -hmm. And uh, part of what makes this really unique is that this is one of the very few uh, east-west valleys in coastal California that opens up to the ocean. Uh, most of California, uh, whether it's the San Joaquin Valley, San Gabriel Valley, San Fernando Valley, uh, is cut off from the ocean. And, uh, you know, they're just little bowls, no high valley, uh, for instance. And so that means that you get that coastal influence much farther inland. Uh, and so that really gives us a, a great growing climate, uh, you know, over a much wider area. And also uh, the fact that we're a river valley that, you know, brings all the water from the Sespe watershed and really all the way up behind uh, Santa Barbara and Carpinteria comes down and through the Santa Clara River and uh, helps to recharge our groundwater basin and and uh, make sure that we've got enough water. So uh, the combination of, you know, climate and water and the uh, deep topsoil, especially as you get farther out onto the Oxnard Plain, uh, really just makes us a spectacular place for farming. Mm -hmm. I never really thought about how long the valley was without any uh, mountains intruding on the, on the airflow. They get hot, they get, you know, muggy or smoggy and you know if you have an inversion layer then the uh, uh you know then the air quality really suffers yeah um and and here you know even even where you know where i live uh you know past uh, santa paula you know we still get fog uh, every morning yeah in you know in the summertime you've got that coastal influence that you know really helps uh, moderate the temperatures uh keep it a little cooler in the summer and and a little bit warmer in the winter yeah well, Chris Sayer, thank you so much for being our guest on this edition of Farm Talk. We've loved having you and learning from you, and, and uh, I'm sure that our, our watchers and listeners will appreciate what you have to share. Absolutely. I appreciate it, Paul. Yeah. And, of course, we want to thank our sponsor, Opus Escrow. 
and be sure to tune in next time for the next edition of Farm Talk. 